Locals here in Fayetteville and the mayor petitioned directly to the War Department to have a permanent garrison assigned to the arsenal to protect them from, I quote, similar acts of insurrection. An artillery company from Fort Hamilton, New York arrived, and among them was Lieutenant J.A. Delagno, who along with Captain Bradford would eventually surrender this arsenal to state militia forces at the beginning of the American Civil War. Sir, I have the painful duty to report to you that today a force of 1,050 troops of North Carolina appeared before this arsenal to demand the rendition of its possession to the state. It is impossible for me to convey to you the intensity of the excitement presently prevailing among all classes of the people of this region. Shortly after the surrender, Captain Bradford and Lieutenant Delagnal resigned their commissions as federal officers and joined the Confederacy in a most striking and local representation of Brother Fighting Brother. Delagnal returned to command the arsenal as a Confederate officer, and Bradford, after being fatally injured in battle fighting for North Carolina, also returned to Fayetteville and was buried here in Cross Creek Cemetery in 1863. While their stories and ideals are forever immortalized at other sites in North Carolina, here we have the story of the women, children, free and enslaved African Americans that were left in Fayetteville to survive and adapt to the war at home. The experiences of the soldiers have become a part of established memory, while the contributions of everyone else have been traditionally overlooked and irrelevant to history. It is clear now that in remembering everyone the Fayetteville Arsenal was witness to a comprehensive human experience of the Civil War. From April 22, 1861 to March 11, 1865, the Arsenal in Fayetteville, North Carolina operated in support of state and Confederate forces. Known as one of the holy grails of Civil War collectibles, the Fayetteville rifle was made here and only here, while most other soldiers, both Union and Confederate, use foreign-made rifles. Though interesting, that contribution was vastly overshadowed by the amount of ammunition that was made on site. From January to August of 1864 alone, over 900,000 cartridges of ammunition were made. Especially interesting is the information obtained from an Arsenal work roster from August of 1861. Listed on it are the names of 29 women whose average age was 20 years old, with the youngest, Dissy Burkett, being only 11. These women rolled the ammunition cartridges here while most of the men in town were all fighting in the war. This was also the only place they had contact with men their age. Several of them eventually married Arsenal guards. Sisters Sarah and Charity Wright went on to marry soldiers on either side of the conflict. Again, another story of this unique American experience. Also on that same work roster is the name of a young Prussian boy, Moses Owelsner. Local and federal census records show that he migrated from Pennsylvania and was just 13 years old when working at the arsenal. As a child, he only made $11.75 for a month's work, compared to $23.50 for Prince, a slave laborer, and $27 for John Martin, an adult white laborer. The work roster also includes the names of 22 enslaved men. Besides the details of their work and wages made for one month in 1861, we only have their first names to remember them by.